That's the first thing. So you can buy yourself one whole extra luffs, one whole extra loudness unit of headroom just by doing that. The idea of mastering being an additional process, they expect something impressive to happen. Whereas in fact, if they've signed off on the mix and the mix is good, it should just resemble that mix in a faithful way. It's just a matter of taking that time, taking that effort to unlearn what you know and then relearn new things. It's not like it goes to these frequencies and then goes, we're going to boost one kilohertz. It actually creates a phase shift, rotates a parallel signal, and then that phase, that, that, that subbing and difference of those two signals creates the boost at that frequency. <laughs> Today's guest is mastering engineer, entrepreneur, YouTube creator, and general all-round mad scientist, Nicholas De Lorenzo. This is his second time on the show, so I'm excited to have a way more casual conversation. He was last on the show back in episode 64. If you want to learn more about Nick, check that one out. And so without further ado, welcome back to the show, Nicholas De Lorenzo. What's up, man? How you doing? I am doing super well. I'm doing super well. Thanks for having me aboard again. How have you been? I've been good. You know, just um, living, the, living the dream, the, the new dad. Uh, studio in the backyard dream, you know, it's great. Nice. Nice. Have you, when did you, when did you yeah. move into the studio in the backyard? Because I think when I was in the States, you, you were around that Altadena area still there. Yeah. No, I think you were one of the first interviews I did in here. Uh, remote interviews, I guess. I think I don't honestly don't remember, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Yeah. Last time we saw each other was Nam. Yeah. That was, that was good fun. That's that's always an interesting an interesting sort of thing to go out to. You were like a uh, you were a meeting machine. Like I feel like you had a meeting every hour on the hour. I don't even know how you can do that in Los Angeles with drive time. How how was that trip? Were you exhausted? <laughs> uh, that it, it was a draining trip. It was really funny. I yeah, every, everything was planned hour to hour, hour to hour, um, and I was like, I'm gonna be back home. Or back to the back to the apartment every day at nine o'clock, be able to catch up on emails and whatnot. I ended up getting back at like midnight, one in the morning every day. It was just so fucked up because you'd go through so many meetings and then people would be like, Oh yeah, we're doing this here and that there. And I'm like, Well, I've just traveled fucking halfway across the world, so I'm not gonna say no. You know, I'm only here for a week. And I always say it every time I leave LA, I get why people are wired on cocaine to do business there. It just just makes perfect sense. You just need that amount of energy to do that that many hours around the clock. Whereas you know, I get it because there's always something happening. Like every hour of the day, there's there's something to do. There's somewhere to be, and it just yeah, it, it was a wild wild sort of experience. I think I racked up <laughs> like forty meetings in the week. It was it was crazy. No, it was it was awesome to actually uh, to finally get to meet. There was a, a couple of people that I'd only met on the podcast or Instagram or whatever that I ran into. So that was a uh, it was worth the trip down to Nam. I can't say much else is worth the trip down to Nam, but um, but that was just meeting meeting the few people. But uh, yeah, how has the podcast been going now? Like this is a bit meta talking about the podcast in the podcast, but like since it started to where it is now, <laughs> how are you feeling about it? It's good, man. It's it's uh it's weird to be thinking right now that um there's video to watch now. So now that this is season three and there's video, it's you know feels different. Hits hits different, but man, it, it's a lot of fun. I I uh, I definitely value all the relationships I've made with so many people. I mean, at this point, I don't know, like eighty of them. Um, but yeah, it's it's absolutely great. But you know, speaking of the podcast, you know, you're a returning guest, so. Well, you've got to update us on your biggest goal. Do you even remember what it was? No, I don't, because I just spew so much shit all the time. It's <laughs> it's like, did did I say a biggest goal in the last episode? Oh yeah, it's the last question. Everybody did. That's right. Fuck. What was um, it? It was uh, it was that. Hold on, I wrote it down here. I don't let's know. See. We're about how, to find how, out if you how how you feel about it. Uh, um, Let's see. Oh, you said you wanted to uh, to use your content platform and your socials to help other engineers and, you know, support projects that you uh, you really supported. So you feel like you've been knocking that out of the park? Oh, fuck yeah. Actually, I, I didn't even know that's what I said. But yeah, that like, <laughs> literally, I've been absolutely <laughs> kicking goals in that arena beyond what I even thought was possible back then. 
That's insane. That is so cool. That's a really good question to have asked all your guests because um, <laughs> I can look back and say, yeah, sh- yeah, like I am absolutely slaying in that arena. So for context, for anybody listening, I don't know why that was my goal back then, but I've I've stuck to it. And basically, um, so I've got the studio, which I run, and that's just sort of an auto machine. Like my mixing and mastering, my, mainly mastering, 80, 90% of my work's mastering. I that That's all on auto drive. Like I come into the studio, I've got the projects I've got to do. They're flowing in. That's good. Like never have to stress about that. So I've had a lot of free time to to like, dabble in other things and content was one because it's like how can I help uh lots of people at scale and the YouTube channel's just been my own personal passion project and creative project to like explore technology, explore the science behind what we're doing. Just be like, oh how does how do these jigsaw puzzles pieces fit together and then go on a tangent where I spend the next two weeks talking to developers and programmers and trying to figure out how true peak limiting actually works behind the hood and put a video together on it. Um, and it helps people at scale because thousands of people see a video like that and they get better knowledge and, and, and that that's been so rewarding. So yeah, I, I achieved my goal. I can wholeheartedly say that was the goal I set out to do and I'm kicking goals and I've got bigger plans for that, but yeah. Well, that leads me right into my next bullet point here, which is, uh, dude, I've been loving the YouTube videos. And like you said, I feel like, A, you're making more of them. Maybe you're making the same number. I'm just seeing more of them. But B, I feel like you're going deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. <laughs> it is like the, the amount of research that you're doing is kind of blowing my own, blowing my mind. It is fun. I, I, um, the research side of it is getting to a point now where it's actually slowing down my video production because I'm no longer just doing the research on paper. I'm using the resources of other people in companies like Isotope or um, Tome Projects or uh, TDR, um, Tokyo Dawn Labs um, plugins, Fabian. And when I'm liaising with them, I'm sort of at the mercy of when they release a plugin or when they do something, because some of that information isn't privy to the public. So that sort of slowed me down a bit, but I have some really cool videos coming out in the future, which I've been waiting on for months to come together. Um, so yeah, keep your eyes, eyes and ears peeled for that. Uh, video production has sort of stayed the same in terms of quantity, but that will be amping up soon because I'm just going to reallocate time to more research because I think that's the thing which makes the videos the best. Like the more research, the more information, the more I can, I don't like it just being my opinion on something like, oh, I like the way this shiny new toy works. I genuinely like to be like, this is what's happening. And I suck because I had no clue this is the way it worked. Let's all learn together. And one of the coolest things is outside of the videos is the comments people leave usually lead me down new rabbit holes because it accesses so many other people's experiences and information and knowledge they share it and then I'm like, oh shit, I got this wrong or I should look into this or how does this work? And it's, 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 it's a really like exciting creative thing uh, to be able to do on top of actual studio work. Yeah. I mean, well, you're, you're crushing it. I mean, they're, they're really, I mean, you know, I've watched videos on like limiter, the, the fab filter attack time and that didn't work the way that I thought it did. And ever since I watched that video, I was like, ah, shit. <laughs> yeah. uh, I'll put a link to that one in, in the in the show notes because it's a good one. Yeah, the attack time on there. Um, funnily enough, I did the True Peak limiting, limiting video and then I was on a call with Bill Podolak over at Isotope and we are sort of talking about the sort of ballistics behind how, the, how that True Peak limit is read and also had another conversation with Fabian at TDR. It isn't eight times oversampling on the signal. It's eight times oversampling a side chain signal for the detection circuit. So if you've got true peak limiting on, you're never actually oversampling the signal. You're just oversampling the detection circuit as a side chain input. So you get more accurate uh, gain reduction. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. It was it wasn't until we pulled it up in um plugin doctor and we actually looked at the phase response at the top end that we realized there was no oversampling going on in the actual signal. It's just on the side chain. And I actually got a post about that. I've just been too lazy to pull up plug-in doctor and take the screenshots for that. It's hard to take screenshots sometimes. Well, uh, <laughs> once again, leading me to my next bullet point, it's like we rehearsed this, but we didn't. I wanted to talk a little bit about 
training your ear and practicing. Like you just mentioned plugin doctor. I know that you like read manuals for plugins, which I think most people would say is crazy. Um, you're a big proponent of doing blind A-B tests and gain matching to make sure everything is actually better. What are ways you think young engineers and even working professionals can keep getting better every day? Okay, get the audio expert by Ethan Weiner. And there's a chapter in it that goes over the uh, the, the four characteristics of audio fidelity, which is uh, noise, uh, linear response, distortion, and uh, phase. So time-bound changes. And once you understand how those interact with the signal, then you can set up your own tests whenever you have your own tools or you're doing any processing to assess how a signal affects any of those four proponents of audio fidelity, um, because those are your fundamentals. That's how all processes work in, in changing any of those four factors. You know, when, when you use an EQ, uh, in order to make, it, it's actually not a, it's not like it goes to these frequencies and then goes, we're going to boost one kilohertz. It actually creates a phase shift, rotates a parallel signal, and then that phase that, that that summing and difference of those two signals creates the boost at that frequency. So understanding those fundamentals allows you to set up listening tests, set up ABs, set up null tests, which you can use to develop your ears. Because, you know, it gives you a guide, so to speak, on, on where, where and what to listen to and how to set things up. Do you think, uh, I mean, obviously I have an opinion on this. Do you think that like if you're working every day, say you're me or you're, uh, you know, even Manny, um, should you be taking a pause to learn a new thing every day? I'll be honest. If if you if you're working like you or Manny or myself, you don't have the time to take a pause, or it's very difficult to find the time to consistently take a pause. Um, to go like I'm just going to stop my work, go do learn something new. It's like even for myself to do it now. Like I'm redoing my calendar schedule like every three months because it just gets keeps getting like overloaded and overloaded and overloaded and then I have to figure out how to delegate and actually manage my time. Um, what you should look for is to learn something new from every interaction or every session or every project you put together. Uh, I think that's probably the most constructive way forward because you're doing the work. Um, don't do it blindly. Be aware of what weaknesses there are in the process. Anytime a client asks a question or doesn't like something, that's a new learning opportunity. Uh, let's say you finish a session and you like something you've done. Uh, Stu Watts in his podcast told me he actually saves uh, presets from his sessions. So if he's done like a particular drum rack or vocal chain or whatever, he'll save that into a backlog or go through sessions on a project, save things he likes. So he has that on file. So if he ever has to go, oh, I really like the, the way I did this vocal chain for this record and I want to use it on this one, I can pull that in and then tweak it. So, you know, there's always opportunity to just learn from what you're doing in the moment. Uh, as much as it's great to, in theory or being idealistic to say, let's set aside some time. It's not always the reality. I agree completely. Sometimes I feel guilty. I'm like, ah, oh, man, I've been working nonstop for like four weeks. I've been meaning to like practice something or try a new plugin, but we all know that demoing a plugin is like the fast track to buying a plugin. So I try to avoid it, but, um, yeah, I, you know, I feel guilty, but it, it is hard to get it into the calendar, even though, you know, it's like, you know, going to the gym. I know you, I know you work out. It's like, you got to keep doing it. Learn something new, you know? Yeah. How do you do it in your, in your process? Like, what does it look like for you? Or does it, does it not look like anything at the moment? You know, it doesn't look like I want it to look. But I do, like, if I feel, if I feel like I'm not doing anything to get better, like, whatever I'm working on that day, I might experiment a little bit more. Not, like, you know, half-day, slow-me-down type experiment, but, like, you know, tried it three different, four different mix bus compressors, bounce out the same chorus, gain match, you know, flip back and forth and, and see which one I pick, you know, and it's usually not the one that's in my template and, you know, take note of that or just try to spend a little bit more time on you know, trying a different way to get what I want than I would normally do. But, you know, not to slow myself down, though. It's, it's such a fi fine balance of, like, getting what you need done in the day and then feeling like, uh, you know, you got better. It is tough. Yeah. No, definitely. Definitely, yeah. I, I, I get scared of going down those rabbit holes because there's been times, like, uh, I, I recently got better, a better plug-in by DDMF and... You can go yeah. on some wild tangents of 
creating processes in there. I had a session down for an hour and I'm like, I'm working through it. And like three hours later, I'm stuck inside this sandbox designing things. I'm like, oh, if I can move, route this to here and then flip the phase here and get the null signal and put this harmonic distortion on it and then resum it through mid side. Like my mind's like just goes too far. So yeah, I, I get how dangerous it can be experimenting sort of in the session. So, uh, so hard tangent. I've had a couple artists that I've mixed for recently reach out to me after mastering, not anything that you did and yep. ask me, Hey, is this good? Or, Hey, I thought this would be more different. And at this point in my career, I, I just listened to it and I'm like, yes, this master's right. Or no, this master's wrong. Why is it wrong? So I didn't, I just, you know, told him like, oh yeah, this is great. But then I'm, I thought about it for a minute. And I was like, you know, young producers and artists, they don't really know what to look for. So question for you as a master engineer, what should people be looking for in a good master? And what's the best way to decide whether, you know, they got one? Okay. Are these clients producer producers, young producers, or are they the artists themselves? These were both artists. Okay. Okay. So I'll, gi I'll give you two scenarios. The artists... Typically, even when they're going to a mixing engineer or a producer, their assumption is that they've got a project, okay? It's a song they've written, it's a voice note on their phone, it's something they've recorded, whatever it is. Um, they want to take that from that, pro that point all the way to Spotify. So that they usually go to a mixing engineer or producer or whatnot to take, take that song and get it ready so they can release it. The idea of mastering being an additional process they expect something impressive to happen. Whereas in fact, if they've signed off on the mix and the mix is good, it should just resemble that mix in a faithful way. So in that sense, I, I tend to work with producers and engineers, but only liaise through them. So that way they're sort of like, this is part of my process. This is just the final touch rather than it being palmed off and going, hey, go to this guy, and then they're spending more money, and they're like, okay, well, I'm hoping to get something back from this, and then they hear it, and they're like, oh, well, this was just a good mix, and now it's a good mix that's been presented and formatted for the platforms. They, they can't really, they don't have the nuance to differentiate what's actually happened there. If it's a producer, however, you're mixing for the real value add there, and what is a good master for a producer and mixing engineer and that team is being involved in that process. So the producer having to having an opportunity to liaise with the mastering engineer, get their input, get their feedback, see what happens at QC. So when the mix gets sent off to the mastering engineer, are any notes getting sent back? If the mastering engineer liaises with the mixer and the producer, what questions are they asking? What's their input? And that way they've got an opportunity to gauge, okay, this is what we've had in preparation for this master. These are these are what we've had pushback on in the mix, which we had to fix up, or these are the questions we've been asked and this is how we've answered. These are the references we've given. And then they've got a better barometer or, or measure when they actually hear the master to go, oh, he followed that direction or she followed that direction and they did a good job. Or, wow, this is actually very different from what we discussed. Let me liaise with them. Let me communicate with them. So I think two different sort of scenarios there. The artist typically goes to the producer or mixer because they just want to get to the end game. The producer typically goes to the mixing engineer because they want a collaborative effort. So you you want to fold that mastering engineer in with it. You said you deal a lot with uh, engineers and producers and less so directly with artists. Do you find that when you when you do work with an artist, there's more uh, more change on your side than when you work with some of your mixed clients and then they are more excited to hear a, a bigger difference? Yeah, I get where you come from. With artists, it, it sort of depends. Well, that sort of depends. It's it's more just a little bit of liaising up front. You know, they'll ask me a few more questions. What do you need for mastering this at the other? You explain, I need these files, et cetera, et cetera. I always try to fold in the mixing engineer at that point. Be like, hey, who mixed it? I, I try and sometimes it's not, it's, it's not viable because the artist is sort of like, typically artists will have very super tight deadlines because they try and squeeze everything to the, to the last minute just before they have to upload. So I don't really get that luxury, but what I do try to do, and when it does happen, it is a fruitful sort of result is I'm like, can you fold in the mixing engineer? Um, are they open or are you open to any feedback? Because it's really important to sort of gauge where they're at with the process and whether they are open to that feedback or not. So yeah, I'll just try and fold the mixing engineer in. If they are open to the feedback, 
I'll give it if it's appropriate or necessary, and then and then move forward from there. It's it's a little bit more set up in terms of crossing T's and dotting I's as opposed to producers and engineers who know what to send in, know know where the brief is at and what to say and what references to give. Awesome. That's an amazing answer. I want to get into, I don't know, maybe maybe a heated topic. Um <laughs> I want to I want I want to know what your opinion is on AI mixing and mastering. Like there's all this tech out there that, you know, is doing a lot of work for us. And I use a lot of it. Stuff like, you know, Ozone has the master assist. You got stuff like Soothe, Track Spacer, Neutron with its like unmasking features and stuff like that. Where do you see this going? And is it like is it good? I mean, obviously, if a tool helps you, it helps you, but like are we going to get deleted? Are we, are, are we 10 years from now, are we still going to have jobs? You know who's going to have jobs? The people who know how to use the technology. <laughs> because uh, you're, you're right. Like some of the technology is crazy that's going on behind the hood. Some of it is simple and just sort of masqueraded as complicated. Like, I, I, right. Yeah. I, I can't go into more detail about that, but put it this way. All, all of that AI technology that you're looking at, you're right. It is powerful and it is good. The more people choose to go out and understand how it works, why it works the way it does, are the people who are going to be able to leverage it in order to produce better results. I can say I'm already using the master assistant, not on every master, but I use it in a slightly different way. I'll set up my mastering chain as per usual, create a second channel, use the master assistant there, and then A, B, and be like, what did I miss? Where is it trying to push? Where is it trying to pull? How is it trying to do this? And I'll, I'll leverage that in, in a particular way. The, the impact module in Ozone is crazy. Like in terms of a dynamics processor, um, it doesn't have a threshold because it creates its own threshold off the gain trace and everything you do is relative to its input. So it's, uh, yeah, it's, the more you understand about that technology, uh, that the better you can use it. It's a new module, the impact one. Yes. On number 10. Oh, sick. So look, I, I think it's I think you can either see it as a as as a threat or as an opportunity to go and learn it and understand it and figure out ways to use it and to the benefit of of like at the moment, probably the last I'm gonna say probably the last 15, 20 years, we've had the same regurgitation of processes. Oh yeah. EQ, what can you do? Boost cut frequencies, cool. Compressor, what can you do? You know. Compress like in different ways with, with different ratios and different side chain inputs and different styles or colors. Okay, cool. But still compressing. These new technologies is huge, is huge opportunity for people to actually think outside the box and bring something new to the sound that they're working on. Um, it's just a matter of taking that time, taking that effort to unlearn what you know and then relearn new things. Yeah. I mean, I, I agree with you. And it's funny that you use master assist like that. Cause I, uh, I do something very similar on, on a mix. Like I, I'll get to the very end and I'll pop master assist on. Uh, and you know, if that EQ po curve pops up and there's like stuff going on, then I'm like, Whoa, wait a minute. For some reason it thinks I need a lot more, you know, low mids. Let's, let's readdress this. But you know what I've basically in, and I won't use the EQ, but the, uh, the dynamic EQ choices that it pulls up are almost always like an amazing improvement. <laughs> it doesn't it doesn't matter like what the mix like how perfect my mix was when I pop those dynamic whatever it chooses for the dynamic EQ I'm like, yeah, that's better. I like that. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. I always found it's it tends to be a bit more of like especially the dynamic EQ that it always sets. It's almost like it's a one brush stroke. Like I always find the same two nodes in the low mid, the same top end shelf that's taming the top and then one in the upper mids and it just shifts those around. And I'm not sure if that's how it's actually programmed to work and then manipulate, but it tends to always be the same for me at least. So I haven't had the same experience as you maybe with it. I mean, I, I mine are landing in very similar places, but I kind of like, I kind of attribute that to my, my taste. Like maybe I like it a little bit like that, but maybe they're always the same. We should we should compare notes on on what frequencies they are. Yeah, definitely. I, I definitely I agree with you. I think that having a new tool and you know that's not like another eleven seventy six clone is it's exciting. And I, I do find that like the more I embrace these things, I even talk to buddies sometimes, and they're like, "Hey, what do you use this for?" And I'm like, "Oh, dude, it's great. You just try this, try that, try this." But yeah, you got to take that time to learn the new tools. That that time that you and I were discussing 
earlier that you may or may not have. <laughs> Which I think yeah. is why like something like Soothe, it took me a long time to like really get Soothe to work because I never really got to sit down. I would pull it out, I'd overuse it. I didn't like it. But man, I I love that plugin now. Love it. Yeah. And it is hard to find time to to actually get into the weeds with plugins. It genuinely is. Yeah, it's it's one of those things where where we can get so many plugin demos, try it a little bit here, a little bit there. It works the first time, doesn't work the second time, and then we're like, fuck it, I'm not even going to bother with it, um, because that happens so often to me. It's it's really bad. It's really bad. I've got I've got I've got um I've had Baselame Pro sitting in my in my inbox for the last few weeks before the launch, and I used it once, and it was great, incredible, and I'm and I can't. Just so anybody listening, I can't give a valid opinion on it yet, but man, I've got an interview teed up with with the with Flowtown mastering for it and whatnot. In terms of we're going to set a date, and I still have to go through this damn plugin and understand it more. But after the first time using it, I'm like, oh, this is awesome. But I haven't taken the time to really go th- go and delve in deep yet, uh, which annoys the hell out of me. Um, but yeah, sort of one of those things. All right, so I want to go just into some some you know technical tips because i don't get into that a lot on this podcast and we've gone through your career uh so let's let's get some of the stuff that some of my audience has been asking for they they want some more technical stuff i've got one question for me and then a few other ones that i think will apply to more people but what do you think about dynamics overall dynamics versus luffs like something that i encounter in a lot of mixes is you know, a really soft open and, you know, a, a very sparse verse and a bigger chorus. And then, you know, chorus two is even bigger and chorus three is like strings epic. And it's like, you know, chorus three is going to decide how loud that track is going to get. But sometimes I feel like the front of these things can be punished by the loudness wars. And it's like, I want to maintain those dynamics, but I also want that opening to be louder. What are you like, what happens when you encounter a track like that? So when I get a track, very sparse dynamics. We're talking macro dynamics at the moment, not transient dynamics. So from one section to the next, etc. The thing is to use base building blocks. Okay, so I like to cut it up into sections. So I'll put the tempo marker in, cut up the the bars for the intro, verse, chorus, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Have it all cut up. Most powerful tool is gain. Half a dB up here, half a dB down there. You know to need it into a space where I don't need to use a compressor necessarily to create those changes. So I'm not doing any detrimental processing to the signal other than a gain change. Okay. So that's the first thing. If I want to even things out, you can usually get away with a whole decibel between two sections and nobody's ever going to know. Okay. That's the first thing. So you can buy yourself one whole extra luffs, one whole extra loudness unit of headroom just by doing that. Um, which is huge because it could be the difference between 10 or 9 or whatever it is. And that's a lot of heavy lifting for a limiter or compressor to actually achieve. So first thing, big building blocks, cut it up, gain. Okay, you've done that. And that's that's a clip gain, not volume gain on the channel post, but pre-processing. So first thing is that. Right. The next thing I like to do is a parallel process with a compressor. So my aim is to find the loudest section of the track and have that compressor working over time. Like I'm talking negative 20 decibels a gain reduction, stupid amount. And the reason is, because what you can actually do is create an automatic volume rider with this. So if it's compressing incredibly hard during the louder section and during the super soft section, it's doing next to nothing. What actually ends up happening on that parallel blend is it adds overall volume to those softer sections. And because there's so much gain reduction in the louder sections, you don't even hear it in parallel. It's all the way below the noise floor. So you actually can increase the overall volume by just, again, it's just gain getting added back in because it's not doing really any compression during the soft sections. And then during the louder sections, it's crushing it so much, it's all the way below the noise floor, you don't hear it. Ah, yes. That, that's great. If you do those two things, you, you've bought yourself two decibels, two and a half decibels of headroom, at least in terms of overall loudness uh, to play with. And you've done really nothing to the total integrity of the mix because everything is either a gain change or in parallel. And when the parallel one compressor is working, you can't hear it. And when it's not working, it's just adding gain because it's a sum of two signals. So you haven't really destroyed the 
integrity of um, the tone there. Yeah, that's a great point. I, I, you know, I think of parallel compression, you know, from a mix standpoint, it's just like, yeah, you parallel compress the vocal, crush it the whole time. But yeah, at this point, you're talking about, you're talking about adding gain and then having the compressor do your volume ride for you. It's genius. It's great. Yeah, you do those two things, you're, you've done all the heavy lifting. Like there's other things like you could look at just using normal compression, downward compression, but there's obviously side effects to how far you can go with that. Same with limiting, same with clipping, same with saturation. There's all side effects to them. Whereas these two building blocks will get you 90% of the way there. The rest is just all for bells and whistles. Love it. Um, and let's, uh, let's, let's wrap on clippers versus limiters because I feel like every, I don't know, over the last couple of years, clippers have become like a catchphrase. Like, you know, five, six, seven years ago, I knew a lot of mastering guys that were building clipper boxes or they liked to use old boxes because they clipped off. But people weren't talking about it. People weren't making plugins. So yeah. what do you have to tell like younger engineers about clippers versus limiters? Let's get to the fundamentals. So you've got a waveform, a sine wave, okay? Perfectly symmetrical. You'll get a fundamental frequency plane, okay? You go to do, you, you get a square wave, okay? Square at the top, square at the bottom, technically hard clipping. Okay, what harmonics does it produce? It's going to give odd harmonics. Okay, I had to search that up a little bit to make sure my brain was in gear, but uh, it'll have odd harmonic series. Okay, that, that that impacts the tone. Okay, now how prevalent those harmonics are will be dependent on how hard you clip your signal. Okay, so you have to understand the trade-off here. So you go to clip a signal, are you going to clip transients, really short transients? Well, then those harmonics that it produces from clipping it, okay, those are harmonic distortions, are going to be masked a little bit more. They're going to be a little bit less noticeable. They might even add some aggression or tone to those transient peaks and hits. Are you going to be hard clipping a long sustaining string section? Okay, you know what's going to happen. Those distortions are going to completely warp your perception and sound of those passages or those envelopes. So the first thing is just to understand just basic synthesis in terms of how waveforms are produced. If you're hard clipping, you're going to be cutting the top, you're going to be introducing those odd harmonics. Are they something that's desirable? Yes or no? That's a sort of a filter you can use as to are you going to use hard clipping? Are you not going to use hard clipping? You go into limiters. Okay, different sort of kettle of fish. You've got look ahead time. It can read these peaks. It is a gain reduction circuit. So then you can say it. Uh, transient peaks aren't going to feel as punchy as a result. So if you've got to look ahead at a limiter, it's going to be pulling those peaks down and you're going to be losing some of that impact. You're not going to get the harmonic distortions you would with the hard clipper, but you'll lose, you'll control it, but lose that impact. Whereas let's say you've got those sustained string sections, a big envelope on an opening pad that's like taking up the whole frequency spectrum. You can use your limiter with a slow release, something like the IRC algorithm that can... Uh, read some of those distortions that it's going to introduce and accommodate for it. And you can get a really transparent way of controlling those more longer sustained sections. So my thinking is clipper or limiter. Okay. Understand how they both work, how they both interact with the sound. Then you can listen to the material and go, oh, this is a really super punchy electronic track. I'm going to use a clipper here because it's going to, number one, add a little bit of character and it's not going to completely kill my transients but it's going to be better than what a limiter would do that just ends up pumping the track and I lose all that energy and vibe. That's great. That is a, that's an amazing, uh, yeah, amazing breakdown. I feel like I got to find some visuals to put on screen. So hopefully if you're watching this, I found some. (laughs) No, fair enough. Yeah, no, because yeah, it's, it's, I think we, we've, we've touched on it a few times in this episode where I've just pulled back to fundamentals. Okay. You have to understand your core processes and the signal you're using because all we're doing is there's a waveform. Okay, well, in, in, it's not a pure waveform in digital world. It's PCM encoded. So there are sample points there that are reconstructing a waveform. And we have to understand how we interact with that, how we manipulate it. So you give the question, oh, what about artificial intelligence? What about these more advanced processes that we're using that use certain algorithms and this, that, the other? Well, how does it affect that signal? There are new ways of interacting with that data. And how can we leverage that to interact with it and create the best sound that we possibly can. Here's a question for you, for somebody that's, for somebody that wants to just get into mastering right now, 
When did you decide that you were going to master your tools the way that you have? Was it right when you started? Were you like, I'm going to separate myself from everybody by going crazy and, and really understanding everything? Or did you work for a while and then cycle back and be like, I really think that I can dig back in and master these things and, and have a better product? I've always been learning and reading in terms of like Bob Katz's mastering book. I've probably read a dozen times. I've got both the, both the second and third wow. edition. Um, and there was a problem with that and not because it's a bad book, but it was the way I was reading it because I was reading it as a letter of the law. And it's not that anything is incorrect in there or bad or wrong. It's that I would read these resources. I'd watch these YouTube channels. I'd read articles on sound on sound and take everything in as that is the way that is exactly as it is. I never question it. I never explore it further. I never try and debunk it. And it caused a lot of issues in my workflow because I'd be doing things and I'd be like, but, but uh, I don't know, but he's a big mixer. Um, but Michael Brower said, this, this is how this is meant to work and I'm doing it. And it still sounds like shit. Why is that? And it's because I'm just, I was at the time assuming that was the way to do it in terms of follow what other people are doing. Le like th there is, there is validity to listening to what professionals are doing uh, because They've paved a path to go, hey, this is how I've done it. You don't have to spend the next 10 years learning it. Here's my experience. But then you also have to forge your own path to have your own experiences and own understanding of your tools. And for me, it was like, okay, well, there was just a disconnect. And I just started going, well, this isn't working. How can I learn to assess this and create an objective, non-biased understanding for myself. And then I just started delving into things and going, oh, well, wh wh where would have it started? Um, even just like how a compressor works. Like, yeah, I always thought it was, it was linear. So you set your attack time. Okay. 50 milliseconds. It's going to take exactly 50 milliseconds to go from over the threshold to full game reduction. It doesn't, it actually takes a r roughly two thirds because it uses, it, it follows the charge of a capacitor in an analog set. Right. You look into it, it's like, okay, well, that, that completely debunks that. Well, you know, like just little things like that, you realize and you're like, okay, well, this isn't exactly how it works. You understand other people's experiences and you can respect them and, under, and, and, and learn from them. But you ultimately have to, at least for myself, this is my journey. I've had to just fucking pull things apart to the last bit to the point where I did a video where I pulled apart an iPhone speaker just to understand how it fucking operates so that way I, I could create a process to produce better masters for an iPhone speaker because that's where my brain went. I, saw I that couldn't one. It was accept. It's good. It good. I, I could, I, I put it this way. I couldn't, everybody says, uh, use harmonic saturators on your bass. Use hum, hum, uh, like just, if you put harmonics on your bass, it plays better back on your speaker. But why? Why? Like that, that tickled me. So I'm fucking, pull, you know how hard they are to pull apart, mate. They are like sealed blue <laughs> boxes. I went like three of them before I could pull one apart cleanly. <laughs> That's amazing. That's amazing. That's a really great answer because that, uh, you know, it, it kind of ties into, you know, the fundamentals. It's like, you can go half your career you know, learning from people and mimicking people and watching people work and doing like pretty solid work. But then eventually you hit this point where you kind of have to go back to the basics and like decide what you like about it. That's actually something that I've done this year because I haven't bought a plug-in this year. Mm -hmm. This is 2022 when we're recording this, um, it, which I've bought two, but it's because they were in mix sessions and I wanted to finish faster. But I've limited myself to now that I'm in this new studio, I can hear, you know, like I haven't been able to hear for years and years and years to just do what I want to do with the tools I have and stop buying band-aids and like demoing plugins and being like, ah, I want a better plate reverb and you buy three more plates. Now I'm still just using vintage verb, except I'm doing stuff to the back end of it and I can hear it really clearly and I can get what I want out of it. So, um... Yeah, I think, yeah, everybody's journey, I think, is is a little similar, but they're all different. You know, you're going to learn what you learn, but eventually you're going to come back to, like, just the basics. 
kind of also related to what we were just discussing. You, I, God, I hope it was you. I think you did a post the other day and you mentioned, maybe it was, I don't know what it was, but you talked about how when you were starting your career and building your studio, you looked around and you saw everybody in the industry like walking down the same path and doing the same thing and you chose to go the complete opposite way. Can you elaborate on that and, and maybe why you were inspired to do that? Oh, okay. Yeah, no, that, 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 was, that, that was me. Yeah, no, I remember that post. Um, so, so basically the premise of it is that everybody's sort of running their own races or, or running a race in terms of, you know, they get at the start line, they know the direction, everybody follows that. For me, you just end up like if, if you do what everybody else is doing, like you've got you've got so much more ground to pick up. You you don't get to take opportunities that you otherwise could think of or come your way. So for me, it was like, oh well, I'm gonna build this studio, I'm gonna do it my way, I'm gonna build up my business my way. And what's really humbling in it is I'll start doing things and then people start copying. And I'm like, that's a good thing. You know, if if people are like trying to get into to, 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 to do things the way I'm doing it. Like I'll give you an example. When Instagram stories came out, like originally, nobody was touching them. I was on it every bloody day. And then other people were like, not, not that I transcended Instagram stories, but I'm saying in the studio space, the way I was using it, <laughs> at least in my locale, people started following that through. Okay, cool. In yeah, terms of the YouTube yeah. channel, I've seen so many people try and do the same sort of thing I've been doing, starting up and then stopping because... I've got my own way of doing things that works at least for me, because I'm not trying to copy what everybody else is doing. I'm just, Hey, this is the way I'm going to like, I, I have the most unattractive YouTube channel ever because the topics are so ridiculously niche and stupidly overdone technical that the people who find it are like, this is really cool. And some people are like, you're such a dickhead. Why do you even bother to do this? Like, because it's like genuinely an overkill. I get it. But in terms of running this studio, being in this career, the, the one I'm in, I just do things the way that works for me, that, that feels right. And, 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 and I go with it. I'm not, I'm not concerned about what other people think. Like you got, you got to understand, and this is some context around that post. I was talking about when I set up this studio, I was 21 years old. How many 21 year old mastering engineers? You built that place at 21? Yes. I built this place at 21 with my own money that I'd earned at 21. So most people look at that and be like, tr they'd be like, trust fun baby with too much fucking money to just like blow on gear, you know, not a serious mastering engineer. But this is like literally my own blood, sweat and tears put into it. And, you know, I, I had to sort of like, I didn't want to be in the race with anybody, any of the other mastering studios that are doing their thing. Cause you know, it just, it, it wasn't comparable. You know, these other, the other big studios are great at what they do. They're talented engineers, but their system of sort of like, they got their credits, clients come in the portal, pay their money, get the master out. That was, if, if I had followed that model, I wouldn't have lasted. It just wouldn't have been, I, I wouldn't have been able to compete. So I did my own thing. I think it's, uh, it's impressive because now that I interview a lot of people and I, I watch a lot of content and, and I just, I just find more people than I did you know, a couple of years ago, just in my LA circles, there's a lot of people that are doing amazing stuff and they're going about it in a different way. Like I, the way that we found each other was through Carl, but then also like, I was like, oh, wow, he, this guy's got really, he's got a lot of stuff going on on socials in a way that I don't think is slimy. Like some people, you know, who are all over socials, I'm like, oh, it's gross. Carl Bonner is another great example. I mean, his, he's the master of, you know, client communication and outreach and, uh, you know, there's a couple other people I've had on the show where I'm just like, wow, you're, you really approached your career in a different way than I did. And I don't, I'm not saying that I have regrets, but I definitely am part or was part of that herd mentality of the music industry. It's like, if you're an engineer, this is what you do. This is what you don't do. And if you look at people that are doing really well, I, I, you know, I think you see a lot of stuff that's in that bucket that says, don't do this, then there's a, there's a lot of people doing those things and they're doing really great. So, uh, yeah, I just, I, I wanted to bring that up because I, I think a lot of people need to hear that. I'm not sure who the predominant audience is of the podcast, if it's practicing professionals or people sort of trying to get their feet in. But I, I think universally for both of them, um, for both people starting out and people in the game, there's always this stress of 
how do we make this a consistent and long lasting career? Like that's something we all want. Yeah. We all, even when things are going great, we're, we're, we're stressed that we, we think that the next month, everything's going to go away. That's like part of our psyche because we know how fickle the music industry is. It doesn't matter if you've worked on a hundred records in the last month, we all think the same. What I can speak to to that is for, for engineers to find their own space to be comfortable in their shoes. I, I know that's like a bit of like lovey dovey sort of life advice, but like genuinely wake up in the morning, go do your job, be engaged in it and happy with what you're doing. And if something isn't like genuinely making you smile or get out of bed to do the work, you know, you, number one, you probably shouldn't be doing that project. Or number two, if you feel it in your gut that what you're doing isn't quite right, let's say whether it's for your social media marketing or the way you're developing your business, your gut's probably right. It's, you know, just go with it and be like, oh, you know, maybe I sh shouldn't do live streams on Instagram every Saturday when I've got three people tuning in. It's not the best use of my time. And if your gut's telling you that, maybe it is. But then you might be doing something else, which is being fruitful and your gut's telling you you should double down on this. Just put the effort and time. I've, I've, I've churned through hundreds of dollars on video editors because I know at least social media and YouTube is worth it. And the reason why I've churned through that money is because nobody can edit like I do, but I'm still like blasting money in there because I'm like, I just need to fucking find an editor so I can scale it. So that's, that's where things are at there. Yeah. Well, you know, I, going back to you, you mentioned you don't know the audience of the podcast and, and whether, you know, they're working professionals or, or newcomers. I think it almost applies more to working professionals that maybe feel like they've hit a ceiling like if you feel like you're stuck, try to go outside the box, and whether that's in your your client acquisition or or your workflow, just like break the norm and mix it up. And maybe you're going to stumble on something that gets you through that, you know, glass ceiling you feel like you pushed up against. Because I know, I feel like a lot of people in their like late 20s, early 30s in this industry can really feel stuck. And you just got to try to change some stuff up. That's what I did in my early 30s. And that was, you know, much better, much better life. Yeah, I, I'd agree with that. Okay, I've got one more question for you before we, we close it out. Um, I wanted to talk, maybe we talked about this in your last episode, about time. You're doing so much stuff. I know you were talking about, you know, how you like are really super organized with your calendar. Do you have anything that you can share? Because you have kids, right? I got two. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so you got you got to help you got to help me out with my YouTube podcast mixing kid balance here. What like, what do you decide is the most important thing you do every day? With just tips on how you block your time because I, I you're doing so much stuff at a high level. I think there's a lot of value there for people. Uh, so, for context, I'm putting in four thirty in the morning till five. So I'm doing. 12 hours because I have a lunch break. Obviously I'm a human. I need to eat um, 12 hours of work every Monday to Friday. During those 12 hours, I am the Terminator. I am in the studio and only studio. Okay. No fucking around on YouTube or doing some stupid, like scrolling on TikTok or whatever. I am the Terminator, whatever tasks I've set out for the day, whether it's projects I'm doing, developing my business, producing content, whatever it is, I am doing that. Then when I'm at home from, let's say I get home at 5.30 to 4.30 the next day, I am the Terminator again, but not at the studio, but in the family life. No, like- Different kind of that's Terminator. How, different kind of Terminator, but like that, that's what I'm trying to say. Like I am fixated on the mission when I'm at the studio and that is all I focus on and work towards. And life happens. I'm not trying to say it doesn't, um, but that's the sort of way I differentiate. And my, my wife knows, like, I don't respond to tech, text messages during the day unless she calls me three times and I think it's an emergency. I just don't pick up. And that's just because I'm doing what I'm doing here and that's just become the norm. But then once I'm at home, you'll never see me, you know, oh, I need to set up this mixing session or listen to this or do that. Like, no. I, I get home, the kids are there doing the dishes, getting the kids ready for bed, putting them to bed, making sure the, the house is clean. Okay. Then start the next day. That hard separation I think is, is difficult for people, but it's like, 
yeah, you've just got to be present when you go when you go home or it's not fair. You know what I mean? Yeah. You don't have to be a psycho that does 12 hours. Okay. That, that's me. That's not everybody. <laughs> it could be like, to be honest, if you're doing five to six hours of paid session work a day, you're doing a, you're doing really good. You're doing an incredible living. Like what's, let's say you're doing five hours yeah. at 50 bucks an hour. That's uh, 250 a day, 200, oh no, no, five, yeah, 250 times it out for the week, five, 250, 1250, 1250 times 52 is about 60,000, 60 something thousand. You're making an average income there. You know what I mean? You yeah. could do that. You could just do your five hours of session work committed and then enjoy the rest of your life. You don't need to be a, absolutely fucked in the head like I am to do the hours I'm doing. But what I'm trying <laughs> to say is you just have to figure out figure out what those hours are, commit to it, know what your goals are. Like you said, what was your goal? Grow grow that content side of it. That that cost me a lot of hours of time in the studio to build that up. So I had to put in that extra yeah, time. And it shows. Your goal might not be that. Your goal might not, absolutely not be that. It might just be, I want to go in, do the best I can on the sessions I do. The business is good. I don't, I, I'm cool with it being plateau, but I, I want to invest more time in my relationships. Cool. Do that. But you have to set those boundaries. You have to know what you're trying to achieve and where you're trying to go. And like, if, if you're trying to do the 12 hour thing, everybody has to be on board. You have to have your partner on board. You have to have your family on board. Hey, this is where I am. This is what I'm doing. This is what I'm trying to do over the next 12 months. I, uh, w do you have any concerns? Are you cool with this? This is what I'm going to commit to. And, and lay out the ground rules. So that way you don't have that stress of being like upsetting anybody or whatnot. Like everybody's on the same page. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I couldn't agree more. I think that that's great advice for people. And yeah, you don't have to do 12 hours. You know, you, like no. you said, you can, you can do eight. But yeah, I just, I, I respect how much you get done and, and maintain boundaries. It's, I think there's a lot of people in this industry that they take their work home you know, for better or for worse, you know, at one point in your life, that's okay. But as you get older, you maybe have a family that, that shit doesn't work as, uh, doesn't work. So yeah, we'll skip one of our ending questions that have you ever chose to redefine what success meant to you? Cause I'm pretty sure, you know, it's probably the same as it was last year, but we've got to ask you what your current biggest goal is again. So what is your current biggest goal before we go? And what's the next smallest step you're going to take to go towards it? Okay, so the next biggest goal is to scale the YouTube side so it's it's its its own sustainable business separate from the mastering studio because I love the mastering studio and I don't mind the way they cross-pollinate at the moment, but I want to be able to swap between both brains and just purely like when I'm doing the mastering stuff, be able to have the business mindset to grow this into the best thing it can be, like let it flourish as great as it can. And then when I'm in the YouTube mindset in terms of content creating, creating stuff for the community, I can do that as well. At the moment, my time is split up really hard between the two because one supports the other, as in the Mastering Studio supports the YouTube channel. If I can build up the YouTube side so it's independent and sustainable on its own, I'll be able to have that switch in terms of I can have an editor, I can have people doing the YouTube stuff, I can have an assistant, have somebody help me with the mastering stuff, turn on and off and bounce between the two where I'm most valuable, which is the creative as always. Awesome. Get the, the scalability cooking. Exactly. Amazing. Well, Nick, this has been a ton of fun. Um, I know you got to get back to your day. I'm about to end mine. Please tell people uh, where they can find you, uh, Panorama Mastering, your Instagram, what, share whatever you want with people. Yeah. Uh, best way to find me is at Panorama underscore mastering on Instagram. My website, panoramamastering.com.au, uh, is almost like a brochure of what I do. It's it's not really that fun to engage with unless you're looking to book in mastering. So yeah, the Instagram is good because I'm pretty loud over there in terms of everything that's going on. If you search Panorama Mastering on YouTube, you'll be able to find all the weird and cool shit I'm doing over there. And then we'll, then, you know, always open to being hit up. If anybody wants to ask questions, you know, that's the way I roll. Amazing. Awesome. That's how we got to know each other. Just instagram messages back and forth dude this has been a ton of fun i'll let you go um we'll uh we'll just go ahead and schedule uh season four for me and you and we'll review your goals again in a year <laughs> yeah well I, I i'm pretty impressed that i hit the last one out of the park usually i just talk shit and i'm like yeah this is what i'm going to be doing and 
some pie in the sky idea and actually fucking knock that one out of the park. So I'm pretty proud of myself. Thanks for having asked that question. And yeah, yeah, well, you, know, you feel good about yourself. Go about your day being like, yeah, I crushed it. Last yeah, year. fuck yeah, of course I do. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. <laughs>